My name is Ben O'Cree, winner of the 1991 Booker Prize for the Famished Road. I'm a poet, novelist, essayist, activist, playwright, humorist, and thinker. The Booker Prize for 1991 goes to Ben O'Cree for the Famished Road. When Ben Oakry won the Booker in 1991, he was the youngest ever winner, just 32, and also the first black author to win the prize. I dedicate this prize to all those who struggle and who suffer in silence and in public, and who never stop fighting and always keep on dreaming. Thank you very much. The Famished Road follows a spirit child named Azaro, who is torn between his existence in a nameless African city in the mortal world and the spirit world to which his siblings want him to return. In the beginning there was a river. The river became a road, and the road branched out to the whole world. And because the road was once a river, it was always hungry. In that land of beginnings, spirits mingled with the unborn, we could assume numerous forms. Many of us were birds. We knew no boundaries. There was much feasting, playing, and sorrowing. In this film, Ben Oakry takes us to some of the key locations in the writing of the book and shares with us material from his archive, some of which has remained sealed shut for over 30 years. We start at the flat of groundbreaking publisher and critic Margaret Busby, a location Ben has not visited since the late 1980s. This was the place I began to rewrite The Famished Road. In my memory, the flat was like vast and endless, and I had a whole place where I played, and a little room where I wrote nobody. No one came anywhere near there. My whole time was spent in that room looking over out across the street to the houses, and I remember the silence. So it feels both wonderful and strange, and uh, a little fearful. Why fearful? Um, because I'm about to go back to a very intense period of my writing life, maybe one of the most intense periods of my writing life. In fact, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a make or break time, it was, you either do this or you die. It was really that serious. It was really, really that um, existential. It really was. How did you end up in Margaret's flat? You can't not know about Margaret. She was, she was beautiful and friendly. Everybody loved her. Everybody knew her. And, you know, I knew her, met her at parties. And I said, Margaret, look, I, I've been thrown out of my flat. I need somewhere to write. She says, oh, I've got a flat. Where? Notting Hill Gate. Great, Notting Hill Gate! <laughs> so I had a little room. Um, I didn't sleep in there, I just wrote in there. It's, it still is a, a dream I want to get back to. It's a table facing a window. Um, I remember finding the window distracting. But here, you're writing, you look up, you see a window, beautiful scene outside, someone's out there. You know, guys looking at you, someone's, you know, you're like, oh, you could just get distracted and lost. You're like, whoa, what's going on out there? <laughs> you know, 30 minutes can go past. So, I'm not a big fan of windows. I now position my, de my desk so it's facing the wall. So that the only window there is, is here. And the thing is about the daytime, you, you sit down to work. Um, you don't have to be aware of it. But at the same time, Half a million people around the, around the city are sitting down to work, right? There's something a bit exhausted about that air. Everyone's tapping from it. It's true. Um, but you start to write at three o'clock in the morning or, or one o'clock in the morning or two in the morning. And it's like there's an incredible availability of imagination, of energy, of inspiration, of wildness, of freedom. I don't know how else to explain that except to say, more people are asleep. In my first two novels, I was trying to tell a story, tell different stories about Nigeria, about Africa. And I told the stories, I wrote the novels, with the techniques I'd inherited from the great Western tradition. The techniques of Conrad and Dickens and Jane Austen. Great techniques, the sequential techniques. This happened, that happened, that happened, and this looks like this. And here comes some description. It's a technique that has 
won its, its centrality over 300 years now. It's almost part of the way we now read the novel. Yeah, it's important to stress this. So when I came to write these two novels about, about Nigeria and about, about my experiences there, I realized slowly that actually there was a great disjoint, there was a great gap between the life I was writing about and the technique I was using to write about it. They just didn't fit. When I read it, it was too sequential, but the life I lived and the life I remembered it was much more simultaneous. Things flowed into one another and time was different. Time speeds, time slows down, time is... Um, time is like a river. Whereas in the novel, time is very stop, start, set the scene, start, stop. Um, it needed a new technique. I didn't know how to get this technique because I realized I couldn't tell that story, the story that I've been carrying inside me to tell, which is a story of a spirit child. I couldn't tell that story with this technique. It was impossible. It was a novel of 500 pages. It would have been a novel of 1,500 pages mm. because of all the explanation. So I had to, what I call, break my hands. Mm. Um, I went back to the roots of language, went back to the, 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 the structuring of sentences. I, I went back to being a child, um, got out various primers and just started all over again and rebuilding with sentences, with short, very short stories, with the short story, just constantly looking for a tone that was elastic to the mysteries, to the strangenesses, the simultaneity, the chaos, the, um, the vigor, the silences, the ritual quality of, 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 of my African upbringing. And it took, it took a long time, and it took the, the short stories and the poems, um, but particularly the short stories, to, to find this tone I mean, I was writing the stories for themselves, but I was also creating a tone that was open. I was trying to create this tone that was open to the, oh, the, the, way, the, the, way, the, the way, you have to visit Africa just once, go to Nigeria once, just step into Lagos for the first time, and you know exactly what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Time is different. Your experience of events is very different from when you step into Trafalgar Square. I'm dealing with really deadly material. I mean, the material of the spirit child, the Abiku child is something that freaks out people in Africa, freaks out people in Nigeria. It really does. It's, it's a scary phenomenon. Mothers particularly. You mentioned the word Abiku and mothers, freak, they're, they're like, oh my God, not one of those. It's a scary phenomenon. And if you are a spirit child, you come fringed with dangerous energies, energies that have to do with death and, and fatality. There's something about it. And then if you're also working with the material of spirits, after a while you become, I suppose, sensitive to them. Um, and while writing in there at night, um, there are times when I'd have uh, kind of major panic about this material that I might, I might go mad, I might lose my mind. Ben, if you could tell us where we are. We're at the Round Pond at uh, Kensington Gardens. And it's um, set five, seven minutes from um, Margaret's place. And I'd walk up Notting Hill Gate through the park and I'd come here, sometimes very early in the morning, and just sit. Sometimes I'd walk around slowly, calm my head down, calm my spirit down after a night of wrestling with words and spirits. I have a great affinity for water. Water is a kind of stabilizing force, a dreaming force, a calming presence. One of the vows I took quite early on was to live near water, in one form or another. So this was my local living near water. You won the Booker Prize in 1991 for The Famished Road and you were the first black man to win it. And I wonder if that meant anything at all in your mind? No, if I'm honest. I really didn't get the fuss about that. Because it, it seemed to be anchored in a, some kind of amazement that a, a black person can write well. 
I took that for granted. Most of the best writers, you know, in the world, when I, the period I've been growing up, were, were black writers. You know, Jimmy Baldwin, Richard Wright, Toni Morrison. But the really big thing was the incredible magnification that the Booker Prize is able to bring to a book and to a career. Before you won the Booker, were you satisfied with critical and press response to The Famished Road? No, and I didn't, I didn't expect it to be. It's not, it's not the kind of book you can be in tune with that quickly. I thought maybe it would take about 20, 30 years. Reviews were divided. Some people were like, what's, he, what's wrong with him? Um, and there were some extraordinary reviews. Linda Grant's about reading The Famished Road and going out, walking out into the street, walking out and seeing angels in the trees after reading it. I think there were about two or three reviews like that. They did something amazing. And they started a lot of curiosity. Um, when people got it, they really got it. And when they didn't get it, they really didn't get it. So this is um, April um, 89. That would have been a very auspicious time for me because it would be, yeah, spring is here. I have a very soft spot for spring. This is my writing desk. If you look at it, you can see that I've got these pictures on the, on the side of the windows. These were pictures that helped me with, with some of the characters that I was creating, some of the moods. Yeah. Where did the pictures come from? I found them. I found them in magazines. I just, I just found them. I'd be reading, I'd be reading magazines, magazines, African magazines, magazines about travel, and the one at the top, the one, this, this, this is beautiful. African lady, but she's got greenish eyes, and I was like, wow, that, that, that really, that helped me a lot. And I'll just put that, that's what I'll do, I'll find these pictures and I'll just put them there. These were all things that helped me with the tone and with the world. They're different notebooks, bits of paper, because I'm, 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 I'm always making, when I'm writing, I'm always making notes on tiny little things. And sometimes just one line just helps me with a whole chapter. It's, it's very strange. Um, I've been writing now for 40 years, more than 40 years. I, I began when I was about, what, 16, 17? So by the time I came to write The Famished Road in, 19, in 19, I began in the 80s and finished it in 1990. I mean, I must have been, I was already writing them for more than 15 years. I was, I was already a veteran by the time I came to write this. And I've been doing it, I've, been, I've written every single form. I've written plays, novels, poems, essays, jokes. <laughs> I've, I've written everything. So it's all, you just, I suppose you just build, after doing it for so long, you just have a whole world inside you of the films you need, the paintings I need, the music I need, it's all inside there. No, see, I'm really jealous of that because I do everything in my head and I've always wanted to create a physical, tangible Oh, that's space not difficult, you can do that. The, the hardest bit is to have it all in your head. I'd much rather have it in my head. That way, <laughs> that way no one can come along and knock on the door and says, look, you know, you, got, you can't go back in there. So you, and you can't, if you can't go back in there, you can't write. Now no one can do that to me because I, it's, it's here. This photograph here was a real surprise to come upon. Because this, this is a launch party of the Famished Road. It was published in March. And um, my publisher, Jonathan Cape, kindly had a little party for me. And, among the guests, I can see um, Salman Rushdie wearing kind of almost BG's glasses yeah. with um, Marianne Wiggins, his wife at the time. If you look at me in this picture, I mean, I look like, I look like you know, this, this very dapper guy, sort of without a care in the world, easygoing, loves a good drink. No, I didn't reveal any of it. Nobody knew anything. The only person who knew was my girlfriend at the time. For Ben, this was a period of existential crisis, fraught with financial and emotional hardship. In his words, the book was his last chance to forge a future for himself. You wouldn't know that, I'm, that I've got a sort of a, a Jedi um, sword battling off spirits at night while I'm trying to finish this book. Get out of here! <laughs> I 
I sent a copy to mum and the first thing she did, very African, was put it on the mantelpiece. <laughs> we have a way of turning things into emblems, symbols, energies, mm. ritual portals. What, how does that feel to you? I think, I think a lot of the philosophy of the book I got from my father and a lot of the energy of the, of the looking for this tone I got from my mother because my mother has a way of telling stories. I've gone on about this. Yeah. She, has a, she, has a, she has a way of telling stories to me that was designed to get my attention um, because I was a very stubborn kid. And uh, there, were, there, were, there were a couple of things she did. She, her stories were always enigmatic. She entered the story at the most odd point. Did you know that... Um, when Tortoise was falling down from, and I'm like, should, can we go back <laughs> to what happened before Tortoise was falling down from? No, she comes in like that, and then she never finishes. And her, her angles are always very enigmatic. Um, that was a big influence on, on, on me. Um, we are on Lorraine Road in North London. And this is where the very first draft of The Famished Road was written. You've called it one of the happiest places that you've ever written in. I was wondering why that is. Because it was um, the first place as an adult, um, after a lot of struggle, difficult period, um, that I had a room, had a flat, had a table where I could write, where I could finally sit down after years of carrying this idea in my head and working through those short stories, trying to find that form, that tone I talked about, I could now sit down and begin this book. Well, um, as soon as the book was finished and typed and sent to the publishers and done, it became clear um, that I had to protect my manuscript, especially the manuscript for this book. And I spoke to my bank manager about it. And he said, oh, well, we have a vault where you can put things. And I'd seen these in films. There was always jewelry and stuff like that. I'm like, so I can put my, my manuscripts in the vault? Said, yes, of course. So I said, what should I do? And he said, well, you have to put it in a an envelope, seal it, and in the presence of a witness, you have to sign all the corners as proof that it has not been broken or tampered with in any way. Then I took the whole bunch of the notebooks, along with some other manuscripts, and put them in a, put them in a box, a steel box, with your name on it. And it's been there, sitting there all these years. How are you feeling about opening it? Are you feeling calm? Um, I've been a bit worried about this moment for a long time, but I'm also extremely curious because I haven't, I haven't seen the, the um, original, the very first draft of this book in, in this solid form for more than 20 years. So I, d I don't know what's in here, to be honest with you. And we're going to see if we can... Wow, this is weird. It's so bad they don't do these notebooks anymore. Isn't that terrible? At what point in the novel are we here? He seemed to live his life in advance, as all his secret and public ages caught up with him. His face became wrinkled, his jaws became slack, his eyes appeared crossed, he kept blinking, he would fall on the road and scream about the road trying to draw him in, and he fought as if against several invisible hands holding him down. When he freed himself, he talked of flying and kept jumping up into the air, amazed when he fell back down and he helped old ladies across the street and forgot to cross over himself. 
late in the book. I'm quite surprised your writing at this point looks really fluid. I mean, I can see some crossing out from here, but it really yeah. does look like you were just yeah. going. Now, what you can see is that's the advantage of writing a notebook like this, where you write on one side, um, and my notes will be on this side. One thing I wanted to just show you, which mm -hmm. is so interesting, I tend to have two kinds of handwriting. Uh, when I want to do is when I'm Going through certain kind of difficult passages, I slope. Um, Why do you slope? When I slope, when it's difficult, when I slope, it feels like I'm writing poetry. It feels like I'm. It it, it really helps break. Um, How many of these notebooks were there total? These are just oh, two towards the end. It's about this high. I must have about ten, twenty of these. Now that you've seen them, how do you feel? Oddly moved. It's very... You know, I, I couldn't do this again. I just, I couldn't do this again. I had to be a... I had to be a writer in my late twenties. I had to have that... The, the energy and the freshness and the madness of youth to attempt something like this. No, I feel very, I feel surprisingly sort of, um, yeah, I feel a big feeling for the young man who was, who he really was writing to save his life. 